So deep sea adventure. Blah 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 blah. This blah 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 is a real simple game. Blah blah blah. It's a Japanese indie tabletop game. Yeah, our friend Chris has gotten obsessed with the Japanese board game industry, so he's getting lots of Japanese games, including this one, which is a good one. They're real hit or miss, like all games are, like all indie type board games. But s- some of them have amazing aspects. Like there's a game called Buddha Babel, which oh my god, I want to, re- wanna- which is not a great game. It's basically just sort of like eh, vote who wins really fast. But the instruction manual is so gloriously hilarious in its English. It is amazing. And also the concept of the game. Do not offend God with your tower that is too tall. Yep. You want you your tower to be tall. In order to win tall. the game, you have to build the Tower of Babel that is the tallest, but isn't too tall because then it offends God. It's, uh, I feel like there's a really good game there, but it didn't quite execute. But Deep Sea Adventure. In the final judgment. Oh, so the other common theme I'm, I'm picking up on, because I see other people complaining about this too, is that for whatever reason, Japanese indie Tabletop people can't seem to write rules very well. I'm like sure they're probably well written, some of them at least. I mean, I've no, read multiple no, people, accounts. People that in English can't write rules well, but I'm sure if we knew, you know, Emily read the rules, she could tell us a better ruling than the English. So, from what I have gathered, that does not appear to be the case. The rules are just not as tight as I would expect from a game mm. in general. Mm. But Kickstarter games have the exact same problem. I mean, games, period, have this problem. People don't write game rules tightly and well. It seems like the only games that don't have this problem are the, like... The people who write game rules well are ga- are rules lawyers, and rules lawyers are usually bad at designing games. It's Rainer Kinesia, and a few other people are the only people who write good game rules. Yeah. Or people with lots of editors. Yeah. <laughs> at big publishers. <gasps> but and even uh, they fuck it up a lot. Deep Sea Adventure is so simple and so quick, and I always introduce it to people as the drowning game. It's a drowning simulator. Let's go. That's correct. Basically, you get a bunch of... I mean, it has a conceit, and the conceit's pretty funny. You're a bunch of uh, shithead uh, treasure hunters who all hate each other, but you're also poor. So you get together and rent a terrible submarine. You're all in the same submarine together. Uh, with the same, and you only have one air tank. But you, you want to get more treasure than the other people because you're not sharing. So on your turn. You're, you're sharing the submarine. You're not sharing a treasure. There's a shared set of air. On your turn, you go down, and there's all these tiles. All right, everyone, this- no, one has, no one takes a tank with them. Everyone's just got a hose connected to the submarine. So yep. if, if you breathe too much air, you will kill everybody. So as long as you're going down and not picking up any treasure, uh, you, uh, the game just goes on forever. Just do whatever you want. And your options on the turn is you decide if you're going to continue going down or you're going to fucking bail and run back up to that submarine. Then you roll some dice. You roll 2d3 to figure out how far you move in the direction you chose. And then you can choose whether or not to pick up treasure on that spot. Mm -hmm. The treasures get better the deeper you go. However, as soon as you've picked up treasure, every time it gets to your turn... The air goes down by the number of treasures you are holding, and that applies to every player. There's one more thing that makes it even worse. So if I'm holding one treasure, on my turn, the air goes down by one. There's only 30 airs. If you got a lot of players, it's hard to... Isn't it 25? It's not a lot of airs. Not a lot of airs at all. But anyway, uh, then, you know, when you roll the dice to move, remember, it's 2d3. You don't move a lot. You subtract one from your total movement for every treasure you're holding. So if I roll the best possible roll, a six, and I'm holding two treasures, I only move four spaces. If I'm holding two treasures and I roll a one or a two, I don't move, and my turn goes past. As the rules like to point out, if you pick up six treasures... I still use two air from holding two treasures. (laughs) And that is key, because if the air runs out, after the player's turn that ended the air, anyone who's not on the boat drops all their treasure to the bottom of the ocean and dies. Yep. And then you play again. You play three rounds. Every, the submarine goes back to the surface, so anyone who's in it survives, even though they ran out of air. There's a little bit more about how you can just drop treasure and try to race back for the boat, uh, and how the lot... Like the There's tr- also positioning based on the other people. So when you move, if you step on someone else, you just sort of fast forward right past them. So if there's a bunch of people in front of you, it's really easy to get to the bottom of the ocean quickly to get more fancy treasures. But if there's not a lot of people behind you, it's really hard to go back up to the... You need people in front of you, whichever way you're going, to move quickly with a low roll. So you want people to be close to you, but in in front of you on your way back to the submarine so you can get up there quickly. Now this game, if if everyone knows how to play it, Five minutes tops to play an entire game. The thing that takes the longest amount of time is the dice rolling. Yep. Maybe 10 minutes. Uh, Teaching the game takes about two minutes, and people just kind of get it. And everyone I've shown this game to, because I own it now, 
really likes it. Like everyone I've ever introduced this to and had them play it, yeah. they just got really. You into can it. basically have all the fun of playing like infiltration. Uh, it means ninety percent of the fun of playing infiltration. I hate to say it, I think this is better than infiltration. I mean, because it's it, absolutely well. I every think infiltration has some complexities and some you know meh parts, which make it sort of less pure and less good. But it has a little bit more fun because it has extra bits like secret. Well, it room. has the fun and the theme, but it also has this meta of the. It, it always goes kind of the same way. There's yeah. only two options of how that game goes. Right, but anyway, so. Yeah, you can basically have all, you know, I think in terms of fun per minute, per dollar, per, you know, unit, it's better than Infiltration. This is like the perfect bust it out while you're waiting for the last person to come back from the bathroom to start a real game or bust it out when you're at a con and the room closes in a half hour and you can get one more game out of the way. Or bust it out if you're on a literal submarine and yep. you're, you're divers. Bust it out like at the table at a restaurant. Yeah. So... The thing I have noticed also is that when you play this game with people who haven't played it a bunch, almost everyone dies or everyone dies the yeah, first I, two rounds. Mm -hmm. This game, like, everything's going fine, and it's just, you know, it's a press your luck game. So, and, uh, should I keep going? Should I keep going? Everything's fine. As soon as one person decides to turn back, all hell breaks loose. Yeah. As good. soon as one person picks up two treasures, all hell breaks loose. Yep. The game is all about leaving Scott to drown at the bottom of the ocean as well, fast as possible. Hopefully you're not the one who's at the deepest part of the ocean when people start turning around, right? Yep. If you're at the deepest part of the ocean, you should turn around first so that you get, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm the deepest right now. I will grab a treasure, turn around, and I'll get a pretty good roll because everyone else is right behind me, and then I'll be on my way back, and it'll be good times. I've had a strategy But if of... you're at the deepest part of the ocean and everyone else turns back, and then it's your turn again, now there's a big gap behind you. It's like, wait for me, and now you're dead. If I'm way too shallow, like I'm near the submarine going down, and other people have picked up multiple treasures, I just immediately turn around and pick up all the shit treasures on my way out just to try to kill everybody. Yeah, there's plenty of strategies like this. Yeah, it's a, there's, there's a lot of depth to this game, oh. oh, despite how simple it is, and I really like it. And it's just like if you if you're the kind of person who plays board games with people, this is like a must have in your library. Mm. So in general, I mean, it's a press your luck game. It's one. It's almost a pure press your luck game. There's plenty of press your luck games. It's like uh, you know, Fresh Fish is a press your luck game in many ways to a degree, but it's much more uh, obscured and complex. Right. Uh, the press your luck is only one aspect of it. Right. But there's uh. No Thanks is a Press Your Luck game yep. in many ways. Press Your Luck is a Press Your Luck game. Yeah, the game show on TV, yep. except if you figure out the pattern and you're not the luck component goes away. And Press Your Luck is also a core, like it is a mechanic, either core or just sort of part of the game. Like it's part of way more games than you might realize. Yeah, infiltration, uh, we just mentioned. Because yeah. all it really means is that you generally have the option, like a real, usually a really simple dial, where you raw. can dial up your risk. Raw. And it, yeah, raw. <laughs> and it dials up the reward at the same time. Yeah, you can just, you know, a lot of games... You can buy reward potential with risk. Right, in most games out there, you know, you're always making these sort of decisions based on a, a risk-reward analysis sort of thing, right? Like, aha, I've got three moves available. There's the risky move that has a big reward. There's a risky move with a shitty reward. Forget that one. And there's a conservative move with an okay reward, and you can sort of choose two. But a press-your-luck game is different in that... You can choose pretty much anywhere along the scale of risk and reward. It's like a free roaming, you know, needle, not just concrete actions. And you can, you know, keep pressing. And then at some point you flip and, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of this movement of increasing the risk until you stop and turn around and, and give up on the risk. You know, like uh, deal or no deal and things yep. like that. Now, pressing your luck, like it's in most games, whether you realize it or not, like even Wizard has a heavy press your luck mechanic mm -hmm. or at least a component because once you're behind, you're not going to win. You can, you got to go for increasingly desperate strategies to try to catch up. So you just dial the risk all the way up. In the last round, you're like, yeah, I'm taking 10 tricks. Yep. You just go for it, even though you've got almost no chance, because that's a conventional heuristic of almost all games. If you're losing, you want to increase randomness or take on additional risk to attempt to get a greater reward, because you play conservatively and you're behind, 
you're guaranteed to stay behind. Mm -hmm. Like, you can't overtake someone with Mm -hmm. a conservative strategy if they're ahead of you because they're going to play a conservative strategy, and at best, you'll maintain your current negative Mm -hmm. lead. So the hallmark, you know, of a game that's specifically a press-your-luck game is the turnaround point, right? At which point do you stop increasing the... You know, it's like, okay, Rim, one out of two chance of making a dollar. Okay, I'll do it. All right, now you have to bet. You have to go all in on every bet. Or not bet. So one out of four chance. The next one, one is a one out of four chance. chance. The next one's one out of eight, 16. It's like, at what point do you say, all right, I'm just going to keep my money and I'm not going to go all in again, yep. right? How do you make this decision, right? It's like, you know, you've already, you know, it's like, obviously, no matter what the odds are in any game, you're going all in on the very first bet, even if the odds are really small, because it's like, if you don't win the first bet, you're, you have zero, which is what... I mean, you can't have less than zero. Yeah. It's like it's turn one. Like a, a pure conservative strategy in Wizard would be to always bid zero unless you have Wizards. Sure. Like, yeah, you're not going to, like, you'll get your two points every round probably, but you're not going to win if anyone takes even any You're also going to take tricks by accident and actually lose some. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, but. But so, like, oh, it's easier to avoid a trick. Right. Than to take you one by accident. You would never in Deep Sea Adventure or Infiltration on the first turn just leave. And be like, oh, back in the submarine. Yep. That there's no reason to do that. You might as well at least go out, get the first thing, you know, go in infiltration, go out, pick up one data token and go back. So there's two things. On get- one end, it's are you behind or not? Like the further behind you are, yeah, fuck it, like full sail. But there's also the before anyone has made a full declaration, like I step out and take a little more risk. And then Scott sees it took a little more risk, so he also takes a little more risk. Like, let's go. Like, this game is totally safe until someone starts picking up treasure. Mm-hmm. So, at what point do you pick up the treasure and be that guy who caused the game to enter the collapsing state? You have to analyze, because everyone else takes their turn before you take your turn, right? So they could all turn back, and then you're the last person to turn back, which could suck, Unless you're already the person who is in the rear, in which case then it's kind of okay because you'll be, right? This is why in a lot of games you'll see... So if you're all the way in the rear, you have to look at the layout of people based on the dice they've rolled and say, okay, if I roll, how likely is it that I will end up all the way in the front? Because if that happens, everyone else will turn back and I'll be in deep shit. So if I can sort of land in the middle of everyone, that would be okay. I would go deeper. But... If I can't do that, I should turn back now and leave them behind and make it harder for them to get back to increase, you know, and maybe take two treasures on the way back to make up for the fact that it didn't go as deep as they did. Now, it's a really satisfying mechanic, and that's part of why I bring up Deep Sea Adventure. If you want to really sort of study how this works and what this does to bigger, more complex games like, say, Infiltration, play the hell out of Deep Sea Adventure because you'll see people, despite how really simple this game is, get surprisingly invested in it. And that is like that is one of the reasons why press your luck is such a powerful mechanic. It causes you people to get invested. The more you've risked, even if you're not going to win anymore. Like I've seen people play this game. Everyone else turned back, and someone else, like in the third round, is behind. Fuck it, they go way deep, and sometimes they almost make it out. Almost. Almost. Unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> but well, there have been times, for example, where people who are trying to make it out made it out faster than they thought. So once they're out, they're not using up the air anymore. And this person is like left outside. And the only air they're using is their own. Yeah. So they have complete control over what's going on. It's not like the other people can come out of the submarine and breathe some air and use it up. So now they know exactly like whether they can get back or not, if they should put treasures down or pick them up or what. And now they can score with like a really deep treasure. So some games like this almost have a sort of coalition building where there's the coalition of people who are continuing to press forward into deeper risk and the separate coalition, these are just implied coalitions, of people who are turned back, who have decided the risk is enough and are bailing. And depending on which of those is the majority is a big part of the dynamic of the game. And then you'll see that exact same thing play out in Infiltration, for example. But there's all this other stuff sort of obscuring it. Like, it obscures the risk-reward. Even though, really, Infiltration, not much more deep than Deep Sea Adventure. Oh, there's a bit of randomness going on. A lot more randomness. But also, like, most of the things are not nearly as powerful as you'd expect them to be. Mm. And you're very rarely rewarded for going super deep. But the game rewards you with these other things like theme and mystery. And you really want to see what those cards are if you go deeper. This 
has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>